When the Dragon Blooded book came out for Exalted 3rd Edition, I made a video about how to make your first Dragon Blooded character. I promised back then that I would make a follow up whenever Lunar's Fangs at the Gate would come out. While I've had this book since its Kickstarter, I decided to hold off on making this video until it had been officially released. When we created our Dragon Blooded, we first made her as an Essence 1 teenager before upgrading her to an Essence 2 postgraduate dynast. We're going to do something similar for this video just to show more aspects of Lunar character creation. The character I'm going to be making is going to first be costless before I upgrade them by deciding to give them a cost. This is not something I recommend if you already know that you're going to be playing cost Lunar, but I'm only doing it here to show you the differences between a costless Lunar and a cost Lunar. While Solars and Dragonbloods had 8 steps to character creation, Lunars have 9. These are concept and cost, spirit shape and tell, attributes, abilities, merits, charms, intimacies and limit trigger, bonus points and finishing touches. Just like last time, I'll go through all of them in order, starting with concept and cost. Everyone has their own process for coming up with a suitable concept, but the best way should always be to first ask your storyteller about their plans for the game. Let's assume that this game will take place on the cowl. I am otherwise free to create any type of Luna that I want, from any direction that I want, with any Shahanya that I want. In other words, after talking to the storyteller, they tell me that I'm free to create any character with any background that I want, but that I should have a reason to be on the cowl, and I would have an easier time if I know the local languages. The Lunar Exalted have three costs, the Full Moon cost of Ultimate Hunters, Warriors and Survivors, the Changing Moon cost are Cunning Devils, Seducers and Charlatans, the No Moon cost are Lore Keepers and Storytellers, as well as Mystics and Shamans. However, all Lunars are costless when they exalt, and in order to get an actual cost, they must first receive Moon Silver Tattoos. A costless Lunar represents the Moon as a whole, rather than a singular aspect of it. Their anima powers make them better than cost lunars at shapeshifting, and they can use the once per day anima powers of the other three lunar costs. Most lunar games take place after the characters have already received their tattoos, and the basic character creation suggests that a cost lunar is the norm. I personally think that receiving the cost in game is a neat store opportunity, so that's what I'm going with here. My initial concept is that I'm going to be playing a Lunar who traveled to the Cowl in order to find the Shahanya to become my mentor and spiritual guide. I don't already belong to the Silver Pact, but may join throughout the course of the game, and uh, I intend to have just arrived on the Cowl when the game begins. I'm the kind of player who often gets inspired by a visual medium. If I'm unsure about the details of a character concept, I often open up Pinterest and start searching for concept art. Whenever I find something that triggers a few ideas, I take note of them and build my initial concept around them. After a few minutes on Pinterest, I came across this piece of art, which I believe is made by Malaysian artist Sarah Gillardi. I'll leave her information in the description below. What stuck out to me about this character design was primarily the red feathers and the silver jewelry. Both the feathers and the jewelry evoke the idea of a peacocking character who probably has a lot of confidence and knows how to draw someone's attention. The facial scars could also mean that this is someone who doesn't shy away from a good fight. If I would make a character based on this piece of art, I feel like I would make a confident character who knows how to draw someone's attention and who doesn't hesitate to get close and violent. In order to help me root this character as an actual concept, I define him by the following themes. Confident, attention-seeking and confrontational. These will be my primary themes for his characterization going forward, but some things may and will change throughout the character creation process. I have a very basic concept and I found a concept art that will act as inspiration for the character design. Now I need to decide his spirit shape and tell. These are the primary things that make Lunar stick out from other Exo types. Every Lunar has a human form, but they also have an animal form that is supposed to represent their characteristics. It's considered one of their true shapes, making them as part this animal as they are human. The Tell is a physical characterization that's retained throughout all of the Lunar's forms. I've already established that my dominating themes are that my character will be confident, attention-seeking and confrontational, and I want a spirit shape that represents these traits. Because the concept art has these red feathers, I decide that the spirit shape should have feathers as well, and that these would be incorporated as his Tell. 
I'm not interested in a bird though, and I think that a dinosaur will be much more fun. I decide to go with a claw strider. Going back to Pinterest, I found this concept art by American artist Jonathan Koo. You can find his information in the description below. A claw strider would fit the three themes fairly well, I think, but it also brings some additional themes that I think are worth exploring. If the character is represented as a claw strider, then how will that affect the way he approaches problems? At this point, I look up the claw strider stats in the core book and determine that they are mobile stealth and pack hunters. The fact that he's a pack hunter gives him a social side that I think uh, makes him more of an inspiring leader than simply attention seeking. I decided to change his three themes to inspirational, mobile, and confrontational, and then proceed to the next step. Unlike the previous Exile types we've covered, Lunars are focused on their attributes. Each Lunar cast selects two attributes from the listed cast attributes, which are Dexterity, Stamina and Strength for Full Moon, Appearance, Charisma and Manipulation for Changing Moon, and Intelligence, Perception and Wits for No Moon. Because I'm costless, I don't get to choose any cast attributes. However, I get to choose two favored attributes, and I decide to go with Dexterity and Charisma. Each attribute begins with one dot, and I need to determine which attribute category – physical, social, and mental – is primary, secondary, and tertiary to my character. I now need to distribute nine dots to my primary category, seven dots to my secondary category, and five dots to my tertiary category. If you've seen my previous videos, you know that I prefer to approach this from the back by distributing the least number of dots first, and then add to those that I think should be improved further. Because I've already chosen Dexterity and Charisma as my favorite attributes, I cannot choose the Mental category as my primary one. For cast Lunars, at least one cast of favored attribute must be in the primary category and another one in the secondary category. As a costless, I only need one in my primary category but can ignore my secondary category for now. I'm still deciding to have one favored attribute in my primary and one in my secondary because this way all costs are still an option for me later when I decide to get my tattoos. Since getting my cast at a later time will let me choose my cast attributes at a later time, having my two favored attributes in different categories won't restrict me from all three cast options at a later date. Had I instead chosen to have both of my favorite attributes in, for example, the physical category, I would have had to pick a cast associated with either my primary or my secondary category, but I wouldn't be able to pick the cast associated with my tertiary category. If you already know the cost you're going to pick, then this doesn't really matter, but I like to have the option to change my mind. I start by increasing strength to 2, dexterity to 4, and stamina to 2, then go on to increase charisma to 3, manipulation to 3, and appearance to 2, before finally increasing perception to 3, intelligence to 2, and wits to 3. Now I've added 5 dots to each category. Since I'm happy with the mental category as it is now, I make that my tertiary one. I then increase strength to 3 and dexterity to 5, as well as charisma to 4 and appearance to 3. At this stage, I feel that the social category is fine as it is, but I would like to improve the physical category further. I make the social category into my secondary one and proceed to increase strength to 4 and stamina to 3. Being happy with my choices, I move on to the next step. Just like previous Exile types, Lunars get to distribute 28 dots among their abilities. But unlike previous Exile types, they don't have any favored or cost ones to reduce the costs. All abilities start at zero, and they cannot be raised above three without using bonus points. At this stage, I try to figure out the character's overall capabilities first before I specialize. I go through each ability and put a single dot in the ones I think the character needs at least some basic competence in. I also try to stay true to the themes I've already established that the character is inspirational, mobile and confrontational. While I haven't developed a true background story for him yet, I picture him as someone who travels a lot through ungainly terrain, perhaps to leave missives or negotiate on behalf of some leader. Even though he's likely from a rural society, it's possible that he spends time in larger cities on his travels. Because of that, I think at least he should have some basic general world knowledge, he should know how to read and write, and he should be able to adapt to the social norms of other cultures. The problem with this is that it makes the character very broad, and it can be difficult to find a narrower role for him in regards to the lunar circle. 
I start by putting a single dot in athletics, awareness, brawl, dodge, integrity, linguistics, lore, melee, occult, performance, presence, resistance, socialize, stealth, survival and war. These are a total of 16 dots and give him a basic competence in nearly every ability. I decide to ignore Archer and Throne because I want his fighting style to be close and personal. Because he trained to fight in a jungle environment, long range combat is also kind of impractical because of the cover caused by the environment. I decided to ignore bureaucracy because even though I think he's a person of fairly high standing within his society, he shouldn't have an invested interest in organizations or trade. I think craft could have been useful since he's traveling a lot, but it's an investment I'm not interested in for this character, and I think that survival covers most of the things he need in the wild anyway, such as making shelter. Investigation and larceny are both useful abilities to have, but not what I have in mind for this character, the same for martial arts and medicine. Finally, ride and sail aren't good fits because I generally see him as someone who travels on foot. I put a second dot in Athletics, Awareness, Brawl, Dodge, Integrity, Presence, Resistance, Stealth and Survival for a total of 25 dots spent. Because I intend to focus on Brawl as the character's primary fighting ability, I leave Melee at a single dot. I also leave War at a single dot because while I think he's a good guerrilla fighter who can lead smaller squads through difficult terrain, I think it's fairly unusual for him to be at war or to participate in war and a single dot could therefore be enough. Finally, I spend a third dot in Athletics, Brawl and Presence for a total 28 dots spent. I intend to come back to these later and spend bonus points for additional dots. However, we're going to leave it like this for now. Now we need to decide on four specialties associated with the character's themes. To cover the inspirational theme, I think we can give him a performance specialty in inspirational speech. While performance isn't going to be his focus, this at least gives him a bit of an extra edge. To cover the mobile theme, I'm going to give him an athletic specialty in rushing. To cover the confrontational theme, I'm going to give him both a brawl specialty in rending claws to help him in his beast form and a presence specialty in demand answer to making a bit more assertive when he needs to question someone. We then move on to the next step. A Luna has 10 dots to spend on merits, and the Lunar Book offers a number of new merits to choose from. The Heart's Blood merit gives access to a number of animal forms, with one dot providing around 6 relatively weak animals comparable to one dot familiars, and 2 or 3 stronger animals comparable to 2 dot familiars. 2 dots provide up to 2 dozen weaker animals, 6 stronger animals, and 1 or 2 extremely powerful animals comparable to 3 dot familiars. Finally, three dots provide the same as two dots plus two or three additional stronger or extremely powerful animals. This merit can also be expanded further as a store merit, giving the Lunar access to more animal forms. There is also merit named Stolen Faces, which can be used to give the Lunar access to human forms. Each dot in this merit gives access to five human shapes of no significant social standing or a single human shape of high social standing. In addition to these two merits, there are several new supernatural merits that give access to animal mutations. I'm going to start by spending one dot on language sea tongue. The character's native tongue is forest tongue, which she gets for free. With sea tongue, is able to communicate freely with many people in the west, including on the cowl. Since I've effectively abandoned my homeland in the Far East to seek out the Shahanya on the cowl, I won't be taking any meaningful merits associated with my homeland. Instead, I'll be focusing on my core themes. I get Fleet of Foot for 4 dots, which fits his mobile nature, as well as Tempered by the Elements for 2 dots, with focus on jungle environments. With my remaining 3 dots, I could choose an artifact, but I don't think it makes sense for him to have a Moon Silver artifact yet, since he's a recent costless who hasn't yet received his training from a Shahanja. Neither do I want to invest in the Heart's Blood or Stolen Faces merits, because he hasn't performed many Sacred Hunts yet. I'll use my remaining three dots to get fast reflexes instead. The Lunar Excellence is different from both Solars and Dragonbloods. 
Because they are attribute based, they can add dice to a roll up to their attribute rating for one mote per die. For static values, they can add up to half their attribute rating rounded down for two motes per plus one. This puts their charm cap at either plus five dice or plus two to a static value. However, the Lunar's player can attempt to stunt the use of a secondary attribute. For example, a character who is showing off could be incorporating appearance in a dexterity action, or someone cunning could add wits to a manipulation action. As long as the action is worth at least a one point stunt, the Lunar's charm cap is increased by the secondary attribute, allowing them to buy up to 10 dice or add up to plus 5 to a static value, assuming that both attributes are rated at 5. The Lunar can apply their excellency to each of their cost or favor attributes that they have at least 3 plus in, or for which they have at least a single charm. For non cost or favored attributes, they must either be rated at 5 or they need to have 2 charms in it. Lunar Charms also have two new keywords, Protean and Archetype. Protean Charms have increased power when used while shapeshifted into certain forms. Archetype Charms can be learned as charms of different attributes and with different prerequisites depending on Lunar Spirit Shape. A Lunar gets to start with 15 Charms, which we will select now. Since there are a lot of Charms to choose from, I approach them in the same way I've approached previous steps, by defining my needs based on my character's themes. I'm going to want some social charms, some combat charms, and some mobility charms. Apart from that, I'm looking for some utility as well. Since I'm an Essence 1 Lunar, I only intend to look at Essence 1 charms to avoid confusion and choice paralysis. I'm also going to only be looking at charms from a few attributes to avoid spreading too thin and to focus on defining my strengths and role within the Lunar Circle. I'm going to start by going through the universal charms and immediately pick up hybrid body transformation. A lunar can already shape shift between their human and animal form, but this charm lets them shift into a hybrid of the two. This charm gives six points to spend on mutations. I'm going to use four of these points to get the four dot clause from the exalted core book. This lets me inflict uh, lethal damage when savaging and my natural weapons are considered medium weapons for withering attacks. I'm spending one point to get deadly weapons from the Lunar book, which lets me add the piercing tag to my natural weapons. My final point is used to get a one dot tail from the core book, which lets me add a plus two bonus to balance checks. Because this hybrid form is going to be my primary combat form, I also get beast form empowerment in order to add another six dots of mutations. I'm spending three points on enhanced sense to give a plus two bonus to perception rolls related to smell as well as the remaining three points on silent movement in order to add a minus two penalty to rolls to detect me by sound. Now when I have my combat form ready and 13 charms to spare, I decide to start by selecting charms that will round out my early game survivability. I want a few offensive charms, a few defensive charms and a few mobility charms. The dexterity charm finding Neela's eye is a useful basic attack charm. Sinio's striking grace lets him attack as if he had a higher initiative. Now that charm isn't too interesting in and of itself, but it gives access to cunning beast warrior reflexes, which improves the character's flurries and which in turn gives access to wasp sting blur, which is a solid extra attack charm. I not only want my character to be mobile, but quick as well. I am happy with these as an attack charms for now. As for defense, agile beast defense gives a good effect for a single moat, and coiled serpent strike turns your defense into an offense. As for mobility, instinct driven beast movement fits the character's charging nature. The final two charms that I'm going to add to this physical suite are the strength charms ferocious biting tooth, which can be used to increase damage, as well as relentless monster pursuit, which improves his rushing even further. Since I'm happy with my physical charms, I'm going to use my four remaining charms to add to the inspirational theme and maybe a utility charm or two. Argent Songbird Voice lets him ignore multiple target penalties for social influence actions, and Arrogant Lion Bearing lets him apply his charisma instead of wits to his resolve. I also want Charismatic Lunar Trick, which doubles nines on the Inspire rolls. I think the charms I've covered so far are good enough to cover my themes, and my remaining charm can therefore be used for pretty much anything to give the character some extra utility. I use it to give him an oxbowder technique for added survivability. At this stage, we need to define some intimacies and a limit trigger for the Lunar. 
It's normal when I make a character that I don't necessarily do all steps in the correct order. Sometimes I have a fully defined concept beforehand and can come up with a bunch of intimacies early in the process. Other times the character is more of a blank slate until the entire sheet is done and I may still have some trouble coming up with suitable intimacies. This character is somewhere in between. I've already established some clear themes, but I haven't mentioned a single detail about his actual person or story yet. Let's use this step to give him some life. The storyteller has established that the game is going to be on the cowl, and I have established that the characters travel there from the east. He has no Shahanja, and he has very recently exalted, which would suggest that he probably began his travels shortly after his exaltation. He's a charismatic person who's a capable fighter and who has spent a lot of his mortal time traveling in the East. The questions I want to answer now is where is he from, who is he, why did he go to the cowl and what does he hope to gain by it? And how can this be represented through his intimacies? He comes from a city called Hanatia, which has been secluded within a lush valley for countless generations. Because of the fertile soil and mineral rich mines, Anati has been able to flourish without outside help for hundreds of years. The valley is extremely difficult to find since there are no roads to follow. However, despite the fact that the valley can flourish on its own, their leadership values some manner of contact with the outside world. But since they cannot rely on traders to come to them, they send out representatives to brave the harsh terrains, find neighboring societies and help establish good relations on behalf of Hanatia. One of these representatives was Kenji, who was not only a valued member of his community, but an invaluable asset when it came to braving the surrounding wilds. He knew the terrain in and out, and both helped fight intruders in the jungles and escort trading caravans to and from the valley. With this very simple backstory, I had the defining principle, be willing to risk all to protect your home. But still, he leaves his home for something. He decides to travel to the cowl. Kenya's exaltation came in the jungles when he was escorting a trading caravan to Hanatia. A fairfolk warlord in the region had been looking for Hanatia for a while, and they had sent hobgoblins into the jungles in order to find the secret pathways and follow traders and travelers there so that they could later invade. Kenji noticed tracks left by these hobgoblins in his travels and proceeded to use his knowledge of the terrain in order to create false tracks and deceive the hobgoblins into thinking they were following the caravan when in actuality they were brought into the lair of vicious spider god. It was through this clever deception that Kenji earned his exaltation. I had a minor try for fair folk distrust. When Kenji returned to Hanatia and told the sovereign what happened, he had the help of the city's priests, historians and philosophers to understand what he had become. They went through records going back thousands of years and eventually found information about the lunar exalted, about Luna and even about the distant cowl. While Kenji wanted to stay in Hanatia and use his newfound powers in order to protect them from the fair folk and other threats, the sovereign convinced him that his divine blessing hadn't come without a cost. He should honor that gift by finding others of his kind. His home would no longer be with just Hanatia alone, but with the chosen of the moon. He gains a major tie for Luna admiration and a major principle, appreciate the gifts you're given. There are no limits to how many intimacies you can have, but it's always recommended to have at least four for a new character. Though this was a very basic background story without much detail to it, it at least gives us a framework that we can develop later. It's also important for storytellers and players alike to differentiate between narrative and mechanical information. While I have established Kenji as a noteworthy figure in his homeland, he has no merits to represent that station. The reason for this is because merits are supposed to have a tangible benefit in the game. Kenji's homeland is on the other side of creation and will likely not have an impact on the story for quite some time to come, if at all. Should a future storyline bring Kenji back to his homeland, then it could be worth giving him some related merits. I sometimes see storytellers force their players to pick merits associated with details that are unrelated to the game, and I think that's the wrong way to approach things, especially in regards to story merits that will be free throughout the course of the game anyway. Lunars are affected by the Great Curse, and they have limit triggers just like Solars, and once they reach 10 limit they suffer from a monstrous urge which compels them to behave in a certain way. A lunar's limit trigger is often related to their rage. 
There are a few listed suggestions in the Lunar book, and I feel that one of them fits Kenji fairly well. His limit trigger is the Luna drives away someone for whom he cares. We have 15 bonus points to spend on tweaking the character, and I intend to use most of them to increase abilities. Each dot added to an ability costs 2 bonus points. I'm increasing Athletics to 4, Awareness to 3, Brawl to 5, Dodge to 4, and Socialize to 2. This is 14 points. With my remaining 1 point, I gave him the Stealth specialty Hiding in Jungles. In the ninth and final step, we need to establish all of the finishing touches. The Lunar's Essence 1, 16 Personal Modes and 38 Peripheral Modes, his Willpower is 5, his Resolve is 3, and his Guile is also 3. His Unknown Parry is 5, but in Beast Form it's 6, because his mutations treat them as medium weapons. His Evasion is 5, his Disengage Pool is 9, and his Rush Pool is 10, thanks to his Rushing Specialty. His Joint Battle Pool is 6, and he has a Natural Soak of 3. With a single Ox Body, his health levels are 1 minus 0, 2 minus 1s, 4 minus 2s, and 2 minus 4s. The only thing that remains now is to list some weapon stats and give him some starting items befitting a character without meaningful resources. Now we're done with our costless Kenji and can start playing the game, but eventually we're going to want to be initiated into a cost. I could see Kenji as both a full moon and a changing moon because he's both a strong physical warrior and a social character. In order to make a determination, I compare the anima powers from the full moons and the changing moons and go with the one I feel is most appropriate to how I want to play the character going forward. The full moon anima power lets the Lunar spends 5 modes in order to add essence non-charm dice on movement rolls and feats of strength, and they gain higher essence of 3 natural soak until their next turn. This would be very good for him as a fighter. They can also add half of their highest physical attribute as a non-charm bonus to resolve against fear-based influence. While that's useful, it's not important for his concept. Finally, the full moon can, once per day, pay 10 modes 1 willpower in order to roll join battle immediately after landing a decisive attack. This is very good in combat. The changing moon anima power lets the lunar spend 5 modes in order to add half their essence in non-charm dice to an influence roll, and anyone perceiving the influence will hear them out. This fits well with his inspirational nature and would benefit his inspirational speeches. They can also add a plus one non-charm bonus to Guile and half essence non-charm dice to stealth and disguise rolls. This isn't super important for him. Finally, Changing Moons can once per day pay three modes one willpower to have his influence ignore his target's negative ties towards him. This is also very useful when trying to inspire someone. I think that this character fits both Full Moons and Changing Moons equally well, and the only reason I decide to lean in favor of Changing Moons is because of the nature of his exaltation. Because he earned his exaltation by deceiving the Hobgoblins instead of fighting them head on, I think it could fit him more to have him be a Changing Moon instead of a Full Moon. This does step a little bit on the confrontational theme, but then again those three themes were mainly a device in order to approach character creation in a way that maintained some kind of defined focus. Now when the character is done, it's time to build new stories with him anyway, instead of trying to force myself to follow any defined themes. Anyone who's played Exalted can testify that after a few stories, the character is going to progress in quite surprising ways anyway. The final thing I do now when the character has a cost is to note appearance and manipulation as cost attributes. I also think that Kenya deserves a more lunar name, and um, maybe you have some suggestions for that that you can drop in the comments below. If you want to use this character in your own game, there's a link to the character sheet in the description below. If you like this video and want to see more, make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. Also check out the Crystal Feather on the Storytellers Vault. If you're interested in more of my projects, you can also check out my Patreon for playable previews of my sci-fi game Machineborn. Until next time, see you in creation.